a nanomedical functionality is the title of this section. And our first speaker uh, will be uh, Eric uh, uh, Jakobsen, um, who uh, is the, he's been on the faculty of the University of Urbana-Champaign, of Illinois at uh, Urbana-Champaign since uh, 1971. With the exception of two years he spent at the National Institutes of Health, and that ended in 2005. He served at the NIH as chair of the NIH Biomedical Informatics Science Technology Initiative Consortium, and he was the director of the N National Institute of General Medical Sciences Center for Bioinformatics and Computational Biology. He um, uh, currently is the director of the NIH-funded National Center for the Design of Biomimetic Nanoconductors. And uh, we're very pleased to welcome you to the podium. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and and this, this device, I guess, lets me uh, forward slides? Yep. Or? Okay, great. The big, the big mm -hmm. arrow. Okay, great. So it's, uh, it's wonderful to be here, and I, I do uh, thank the, uh, the organizers. I think that um, to be able to uh, discuss uh, good science in beautiful, natural surroundings must be one of the highest pleasures available to humans. Um, I'm going to set my own alarm for uh, 15 minutes so that uh, you'll, you'll hear something that sounds like an old-fashioned telephone, and that'll tell me that it's time for me to uh, stop talking and take a couple of questions. So the, um, and I aim this here? Yes. No, no. aim it at the screen. Aim it at the screen. Okay. The point's not smart enough here. Okay. So, so what is, so th these are the parts of the talk, and each of which I'll try to, give a, just a couple of minutes to, uh, what are we, what is the National Center for Design of Biomimetical Nanoconductors? Introduction to our, our three, three of our constructs, functional protocells, virus-like particles, and the delivery protocell. Some results that we have on targeting cancer cells with virus-like particles, and results we have with um, antiviral work using honeypot cells, and finally, uh, uh, collaboration uh, possibilities that uh, that we would we would like to explore. Um, we're funded by we're one of eight uh, NIH nanomedicine development centers funded by the uh, roadmap program at National Institutes of Health. Uh, we're actually we actually should be called a consortium rather than a um, uh, rather than a center because we're we're all over the place. We're in Urbana and in Albuquerque and uh, in, at, at NIST near Washington, D.C., and University of Chicago and Illinois Institute of Technology and at the Weill Medical College of Cornell University. What ties us all together is that we're all interested in understanding the behavior of membranes on uh, solid supports and especially nanoporous supports which permit uh, the the um, the membrane and the support together permit interaction between two sides of this um, uh, of, of this formulation, and the work that I'm going to describe today is uh, not coming from my lab. I'm I'm a theoretician and a computer person, and I'm trying to catch up. We're desperately trying to catch up with the experimentalists, and this I think is the nature of the kind of nanoscience that we do because we focus on self-assembled systems. And typically in self-assembled systems, as opposed to the other kinds of systems that we've, um, uh, some of the other kinds of systems that we've been hearing about, where you build precision into the system by engineering it in very explicitly, uh, what we do is we simply borrow the specific attributes of biological molecules and yet we don't, our understanding at, for example, atomic scale of resolution of how they do what they do is actually rather meager. 
So in a certain sense, you could say that uh, uh, we, we explore that part of nanoscience where you don't actually know what you're doing. The, um, and uh, so, so uh, uh, I, I made a judgment that you'd be much more interested in the work that was happening at Sandia and at NIST and at Cornell than in my struggles with better force fields for membranes and, and stuff like that. So um, here's a, uh, we, the, the, Jeff Brinker's lab at Sandia had very early, a decade ago, developed a technology which is briefly outlined here in uh, thermodynamically for making nanoporous silica objects. Uh, essentially these are, uh, these, these start out life as sort of marbles with uh, surfactant and silica intertwined and then you burn off the surfactant with UV and you wind up with these, um, uh, with these silica particles. And the, um, and, and, uh, the details of this are, are, have been published for some time. But what we decided to do in our center was to borrow this technology uh, and to coat these nanoporous silica spheres with membranes that are like biological membranes that have transporters, that have channels, that have receptors. And uh, so essentially these are like liposomes, um, but they're different in, in really an important, uh, several important ways. And um, one way is that you can load these up to very, very high concentration. Uh, essentially, uh, you know, you're only limited by solubility limits, and actually in some cases you can even go beyond that a little bit, uh, because the way you get stuff into these nanoporous silica spheres is that you um, put them in an electrolyte, you put them in a solution of what you want in the sphere, you drive off the water and you're wound up with as high a concentration as you want um, inside. The uh, silica is, um, now I suppose that uh, in the kinds of uses that we're envisaging, um, silica might be toxic, uh, and we don't know that, uh, but we do know that, for example, our toothpaste is full of silica, uh, uh, and uh, it, it's, in a, it's, it's in our environment uh, a lot. Um, Jeff uh, Brinker and his associates are able to uh, tune the size of these spheres, the internal porosity, the diameter of the uh, the diameter of, of the entrance between the inside and the outside, uh, very very uh, very very closely. And as you're going to see, and one of the things that we've discovered is that uh, these these protocells actually enter living cells much much more readily than liposomes do. And and we don't we are beginning to understand that. Uh, with some simulations from coarse-grained molecular dynamics as being the effect of how the, 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 um, the support modulates uh, the surface tension of the membranes. But, but to say that we understand that at any level of detail would be uh, premature. Um, so we have a library of, of uh, protocells with different core contents, different lipid shells. And one of, oh, and this 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 um, this slide refers to one of the um, uh, one of the things that uh, that we discovered early on, which was that uh, neutral protocells enter culture hamstered ovary cells very very readily, and under circumstances where um, the uh, under circumstances where the um, uh, liposomes where vesicles simply of the same composition simply won't enter. And this is also true of bacterial cells. Uh, the, the smaller uh, protocells enter E. coli very readily. Uh, for some reason, uh, we don't get into yeast cells that readily. Um, the, uh, and, and we're not really sure of what the, the difference is, but, but so one of the advantages that's become clear is that compared to unsupported vesicles, we get into cells uh, very quickly. So we're, um, 
Uh, one of our collaborators is a microbiologist, Linda Kenny, at U of I Chicago. And what we'd like, uh, one of our visions, is that we're going to be able to deliver uh, small RNAs uh, to actually, actually do uh, genetic engineering or epigenetic engineering of, um, of cells without the necessity, and, and do it in a way that one could envisage doing it in a clinical setting, um, and that we could perhaps deliver, and, and that we could, so here's, here's one vision, okay, because we're being encouraged to talk about, about the future. So one vision is that with the ability to deliver, in, in a clinical setting, with the ability to deliver small peptides or to deliver nucleic acid into bacteria, we could tune the delivery to interfere with and to knock down uh, gene products, to knock down genes that are specific to those bacteria because we can engineer uh, the therapy to the particular sequence of the bacterium. And, and so we're, we're looking down the road at this as a strategy to overcome acquired drug resistance because since we're, uh, since our, since we're looking at, at delivering therapies that would be specific for the particular genetic makeup of the bacterium, hopefully we can redesign those therapies to keep up with acquired drug resistance. Now, a second, um, uh, a second um, type of protocell is a honeypot cell uh, that, uh, which, which has sort of, we, we name for obvious reasons, it is, it, what it's designed to do is be a kind of nanoscale flypaper and to, um, uh, to soak up uh, by means of being coated with specific uh, surface receptors, viruses or bacteria, and I'll talk about an antiviral application that's being developed uh, in our consortium at, um, at the Cornell University Medical School. Um, and and uh, the third application is, is for compartmentalization of um, protein to understand uh, lipid oxidation at plasma membranes, which we, uh, is believed to be associated with macular degeneration. Um, and then the second, um, the second construct in addition to the protocell that, that we work on are viral, li virus-like particles. Now, if you go to the Wikipedia, uh, which many of you could do right now, and you look up virus-like particles, you'll see that they are designed, uh, the, the common definition is that they're designed explicitly not to be infectious. That what they're designed to do is to, uh, is to, is to for example, function in a vaccine to promote an um, antibody uh, response by the surface coating, but not to be infectious. Well, we want to do something different. We want to make virus-like particles that will infect cancer cells and will kill them and will selectively uh, infect cancer cells. And, and I'll uh, show you our progress towards that. So, um, so the first target, and this is work at Sandia and University of New Mexico, um, by, by our team there. The first target are uh, liver cancer cells. And they're, um, and they're targeted by coating the virus-like particles with a protein, with a peptide that's a, a recognition, that's, that's a previously well-established recognition peptide for the, for the liver cancer cells. Um, and what we find is that, in fact, the protocells do conjugate with the liver cancer cells to a high efficiency. Um, we find Now, this we, of course, I, I, I want to keep stressing this. This we is the royal we. This we is the, uh, or, or maybe to put it in more earthy terms, it's like the, um, the manager of the prize fighter who, between and round, says, we're doing great. He hasn't hurt us yet. Uh, so this is this is happening at another. I mean, the the best, the only really, the only credit I would take for this work is that when we were writing the grant proposal, I assembled uh, this team of people, and uh, aside from that, uh, 
uh, you know, this, 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 the credit belongs to others. But, um, but we do bind uh, very, very well to the, um, to the liver cancer cells. Uh, now, one of the questions is, are we going to provoke an immune response? And so we do find that coding with other peptides, in addition to the primary recognition peptide, uh, uh, other peptides that would be designed to um, moderate the immune response, uh, that, 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 doesn't, uh, that doesn't deleteriously affect the recognition and the binding to the cancer cells. Um, we're, we're up to 150-fold higher affinity for the liver cancer cells than for normal hepatocytes. Uh, one would like it even higher, but this is, um, this is where we are now. Uh, and these conjugates are endocytosed by the liver cancer cells and are not internalized by normal hepatocytes. So we've gotten the virus-like particles into the cancer cells and, and, and they don't go into the normal hepatocytes. Now we don't know. There's, there's a screen being set up to look at all sorts of other uh, cultured cell types, human types, uh, to see if, if we're, they also do not take up uh, these particular uh, engineered conjugates. And uh, you know, this is the uh, this is the problem with self-assembled systems. You don't really, you can't really deduce these answers. You have to do all the experiments to see, uh, and they not only get in, but uh, if you load them up with doxorubicin, you kill the cancer cells. And if and again as a control, if you um, do exactly the same thing with the normal hepatocytes, okay. Oh my gosh. Okay, so I'm going to go really fast now. So there's, okay, so um, so that's 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 where we are with the virus-like particles and targeting cancer. And of course, the dream there. Um, so the deadliest, what what really we're we're after metastasis. The dream is that we can put these particles into the circulation. They will circulate. They will find potential. They will find potential sites for metastatic foci and, and, and kill them. And uh, uh, so, so one of the things to keep in mind is that our strategy is really aimed, I mean, I, it could be adapted to tumors, but what we have in our mind is that we're going after metastasis. Okay, I'm going to change directions, and now I'm going to give you actually a very vague talk. I'm going to be very vague on the details. Uh, this is from David Levan, Anne Moscona, uh, Matteo Parato, and they haven't published yet. So they asked me, uh, I said, yes, we could post this, but it's uh, sort of scrubbed of some identifiers, although I'm not even going to say which virus, although if you Googled Anne Moscona, you'd figure out which virus it is. And, uh, but, um, but, the, but the strategy is we put a human receptor on the surface of a protocell a human receptor that we know is critical for the viral entry. And we see if we can soak up the viruses out of, uh, for example, a, a cell culture. And um, so here are the actual findings. So the microscale, so one of the things that happens is that the nanoscale honeypot cells don't work. Apparently the curvature of the surface is important. Microscale honeypot protocells work and they work better than we imagined they would because they don't saturate. They interact with the viruses. They, the viruses go away, and after that, the viruses have lost their infectivity. We believe that that's possibly because it prematurely triggers a particular protein, the F protein, that is part of the entry process, that that, that, goes, that, that undergoes a conformational change, goes into a refractory state, and... Uh, uh, and, and this is true of the, the macro-scale protocells with lipid membranes around them. Nickel nanoparticles with polymer surfaces, same receptor, they work the way we thought the honeypot cells would work. They bind the viruses and saturate. The honeypot microcells accumulate proteins on the surface, but that doesn't seem to diminish their effectiveness. 
and they may be capable of being lyophilized. We've only been working with them for about a year. Every once in a while, uh, we take the, the dry ones off the shelf and see if they're still active, and they still are. So uh, our hypothesis is that, that you know, our, our hope is that they can be uh, effectively lyophilized. Now, what we don't know, and, and we're looking into this on the more basic research side of our enterprise uh, with experiments on controlled patches of lipid from the lab of Atul Parikh and uh, simulation work from my lab and uh, lab of Larry Scott at IIT, is can we understand the physics so that we can actually simulate it of viral attachments and entry into human and other cells? And, and, and so we're trying to tackle these scientific questions and the clinical questions simultaneously. Uh, we're very interested in, in applying our technology to collaborations with cancer biologists, with toxicologists, because we, we actually don't really have good ideas about the potential toxicity of what we're doing. Virologists, microbial disease scientists, and uh, so thank you so much for, again, inviting me and for your attention during the talk. Well, uh, thank you for that uh, fascinating talk, and particularly with all the potential. Uh, if I may just comment, uh, the um, uh, most cancer of the liver in humans is caused by the, by the hepatitis B or hepatitis C. The, you, uh, ordinarily don't find the virus in the cancer cells. Mm -hmm. They're, they tend to be virus-free. Killing the cancer cells may have the effect of actually increasing the probability of more cancer because mm -hmm. you then have to have additional, it's a stimulus to uh, additional replication of the cells, of the cancer cells. So I think, but there is the possibility actually of, as we spoke about before, of, uh, of trying to direct your uh, taking the virus as, as a target, and that's come up several times in our talks. But I think it's counterintuitive, but I think uh, you'll have to look at that very carefully. Yeah, so um, actually that's a segue into something that we're starting to do, if I could Please. comment. Yeah. Yeah. So, so um, we're in the process right now of putting together a proposal for a team of people, a combination of cancer biologists, and nanotechnologists to build what we call a cell hotel, where we can control and manipulate the environment of cancer cells and uh, measure many things about them simultaneously. So, uh, so we could look, for example, at the um, uh, at at whatever we do uh, as a as a stimulus for these cells to uh, replicate. At, at an accelerated rate, among, among other things. Now, now this is, again, this is in vitro, so uh, it, uh, uh, but, uh, but anyway, that's where we're, we're coming from. Well, I'd recommend you, uh, as you suggested in your slides, that you connect with mm -hmm. some, both cancer bi biologists and, and uh, mm -hmm. physicians and uh, with the virologists because of, yeah. It because actually, you may get the contrary effect. Mm -hmm. You get okay. the. Uh, are there questions other than mine <laughs> on the for the speaker? Well, it's a fascinating process, and thanks very much for your talk. <laughs>